All right, as I previously mentioned, I'm going to be going over a little bit of um, some of the things I learned, or one, one thing in particular that I learned at the Red Out Preaching Conference, and one of the reasons I'm really glad I went. It was a great time. There's a lot of great sermons preached there. If you haven't heard them, I suggest you go find them online and listen to them. And um, they were all, uh, there was a little bit of a theme, it seemed, for the few of them, and, uh, and they were very much related. But um, anyhow, what, what I ended up preaching on there yesterday was on standards, just having godly standards in your life. And I kind of hit a, a wide variety of topics. And, uh, you know, having standards are very important, right? Being able to maintain at least some kind of a minimum acceptable behavior in your life. So you set standards for, you know, from everything from how you dress to how you work, how much you sleep and, and all these things. You know, I believe firmly and I taught that in my sermon yesterday that we all ought to have standards, right? If you don't have standards, it's just going to let everything go. And, and if you don't have a, a start starting or a stopping point on certain things already established in your mind, it's a lot easier for things to get out of control. So you need to have those kinds of standards. Now, one of the passages I referenced was here in Titus chapter 2. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. That's what God wants us to do. We ought to live godly, right? Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And what I was focusing on when I preached yesterday was that, that phrase there of a peculiar people because when you're living godly, you're going to be peculiar. You're going to be a little bit different. You're not going to be like everyone else out in the world, right? That all makes sense. But what I'm going what I'm to be focusing on more this evening is the, la the last part of verse 14, zealous of good works. See, what happens with, with standards, you know, I, um, they're really good to have. And I, and I firmly believe that, and, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have preached it yesterday. And I still believe that today, but sometimes you can hit a point in your life when you feel like you're struggling and it becomes a burden just to meet those standards where it's like, you know, thank God you set up those standards. But sometimes you get to the point where you feel like, you know, you get real busy with other things and then you almost feel like you're, you're struggling just to keep your head above water and the Christian life becomes more miserable than joyful. And you feel like it's a burden to have to, to meet these standards and have to do these things. And it is important, like I said, to maintain those standards so you don't just go off the deep end, right? You still want to maintain in those areas of your life where maybe you're kind of going, and you're going through a rough spot, you know, things aren't quite as exciting for you or whatever. Things get a little bit difficult. You need to maintain because we're in the Christian life for, I mean, it's the long haul. And we don't want to let ourselves just backslide into an abyss. So, so maintaining those standards are good. However, you get, if you get the, the wrong focus, you can be too focused on, these, on the standards that you set up as just being like a burden to you than it ought to be. And this actually stood out to me, and I didn't realize this. I'm going to confess my sin to you. This is the, this is the way I started to feel recently without even realizing it. And I think it happens to everybody from time to time where you get to this point and you're not even aware that you've gotten to that point. And it can be difficult. Look, I work a full-time job. I've got a family. I pastor a church. I've got a lot of obligations, right? So you, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy by any means. But there's a lot of things, a lot of standards that I have in my life that I say, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to meet this. And you might get a little weary from time to time. It might seem to be a bit of a burden, but the Bible is very clear on teaching us that, you know, we ought to be joyful. We ought to have joy in our lives and not, and not think that doing service to God is some great thing or some burdensome thing or some trouble. And one of the things that pointed out to me, I really just kind of slapped me in the face, was when I went out on soul winning on Saturday. And, and even just throughout the whole course of the, of the event. Because you're meeting people. I've met people there, some for the first time, some I've met before. People traveling from all across 
the country and even in, in other countries to go and be a part of this event. And, you, and you're running into and you're meeting a lot of people who are really zealous and really on fire and, and they love God and things are going great. And you could see, man, they're, they're, they're really working and doing a lot for God. That's exciting just to be around. That's exciting just to, to be a part of. And we went out soul winning and one of the guys turned on some hymns. You know, just kind of getting in that spirit and just excited and pumped to go soul winning. And I realized, I was like, wow. I've been recently kind of going out soul winning as just, well, we got to go soul winning. Well, got to do this. Well, got to, and I was ashamed. I mean, I'm going out with these young guys and here I am, the pastor of a church. And I've allowed myself to get this type of an attitude of almost like a drudgery to go and do these things. And I thank God that I went and was a part of this and was able to, to, to see that these people who were zealous of good works because that helped me quite a bit. And now I feel like I'm back on track. I've come back from that, from that trip with the right focus. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you know, the Bible talks about this very thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1, the Bible says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. See, being zealous towards God, being zealous to doing the work of God and to serving God and to coming to church and to going soul winning, that provokes many other people to doing good works. And what happens is when you are more discouraging and see things as a burden, that's also going to be rubbing off on people. That's also going to be provoking people, but not in a good way. See, both attitudes will impact those around you. And we need to be aware of this mindset and not let it start rubbing off on everyone else. If you start get, you know, feeling like you're getting, things are getting a little too tough or, or you feel like you're getting things to be a drudgery, we need to try to maintain our zeal and, and to look for the joy in the Christian life. And, and you know, this is why I love the conference so much and really promote it. This is why, you know, all the way going up this conference, hey, if you can make it out there, get out to this event. If you could get, you know, like one vacation, make it out to this event because it really does a lot for the soul and it's great to be around these people and, and you're guaranteed, I think you're guaranteed to learn something. If, if you're paying attention, if you're getting involved, if you're being active, you will learn something. You'll walk away, hopefully, you know, a little bit changed for the better. And that, that's the whole point of going to this. And it's so good to meet people that love the Lord and to be in that environment and see the zeal that they have. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And we really need to be looking out for this type of a spirit of, of not being excited about serving God. We really do. It's, it's something that's going to stifle, one, it's going to stifle the growth of this church. If we're just kind of showing up, you know, punching in, punching out, checking off the box. Yeah, I went to church today. Yeah, I read my Bible. Yeah, I went soul winning. You know, it's just, well, I got to do this, so I'm going to do it. God's not going to really be working. You know, look, we, we ought to be doing that because you don't want to just get into sin, right? And that's the point of having the standard. But, but we want to be able to go beyond that. See, I view it like when you have a standard for yourself, that's the minimum. I mentioned yesterday one of the standards was for Bible reading. And in my opinion, a standard would be, for example, reading the Bible once cover to cover within the course of a year. But see, when I look at that, I, 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 that's a minimum for me. That's like, if, if I don't do anything else, I need to make sure I'm at least doing that. But when your spirit starts getting lousy, when they start getting, you know, turned off, you start getting weary about doing the work for God, you just could be looking at that as like, I need to at least reach up to that. And, and that kind of, you know, that's not the attitude you want to have. We want to be looking at, hey, if nothing else, I'll do this, but I'm looking to do more. I, I want to I I know more. I want to serve God more. I want to do what's right. And we need to be looking out for each other. If you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
this isn't even just for people within your own church. Obviously, in the local congregation, we do look out for each other. This is a church family, and we care for one another, we pray for one another, we edify each other. And that's, that's one of the, the, the benefits of coming to church, is, is to provoke one another to love and to good works. But not even just within our own church, among other believers that you become friends with. And again, at this conference, you're able to meet up with people and make friends from other areas and, and hopefully be able to maintain those types of friendships. See, Paul sent Timothy to comfort other Christians, other people they knew that wasn't a part of his church, but other people that he had won to Christ and a church that had gotten started in Thessalonica. And we see in chapter 3 that, that he sent Timothy to comfort them, and then he also was comforted by the report that he brought back. And they're looking out for each other and just hoping to establish them and strengthen them during difficult times. Look at verse number 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. The Bible says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And ye know. So basically what was happening here is that, you know, the apostles, the disciples were, were being persecuted. And he knows that there's these younger Christians in, in Thessalonica and he's like, I don't want you guys to be shaken in your faith that all these things are happening, that all these persecutions are coming and let that scare you or make you lose your faith because of all these things that are happening. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to send Timothy just to make sure that things are going well with them, that they're not um, you know, going to start, start going down the wrong path because of these events. So he sends Timothy, it says in verse 5, for this cause when I could no longer forbear... I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Paul loves these people a lot. He loves them so much to send someone and say, look, I, just, you know, I can't forbear anymore. I can't wait any longer. I need to send somebody. I need to see how these people are doing. I need to make sure that they're okay and that Satan hasn't gotten to them through these afflictions. And he reminds them, you know, I told you before we're going to suffer tribulation. I just need to make sure you remember that. I need to make, you know, help you to make sure that these aren't overthrowing your faith. Look at verse number six. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And Apostle Paul, I was saying here how much they have benefited him, how much they have benefited all of those that were being persecuted and going through tribulations because they found out when Timothy, when Timothy came back, he's like, yeah, they're going strong. They're going good. They've got good faith. They've got good charity. They're doing the works. They're solid. That's a good report. That's exciting. That's comforting to know, hey, even though these afflictions and these tribulations have come, they're remaining steadfast. I have spoken with multiple people at Verity because I've been there multiple times now. I was there for their first service. I was there about four years ago, right before I started pastoring this church. And I was there again last year, and I was there again this year. And when you see the same faces in the congregation, people that I've met, Brother Daryl, um, Brother Vincent, Brother Ron, all these guys that I've, that, I, that I've met previously, they've been going there now for years. I mean, I, I met all of those guys four years ago. Hey, that's a comfort. It's good to see those people still being faithful, still coming to church, still there year after year after year. Hey, brother, how you doing? And just, just to meet up and see how things are going. That is a comfort. It's a comfort for me, and hopefully it's a blessing to them too, right? When, someone, when people keep coming back, you're not falling out. Hey, they had a lot of persecution last year. It's nice to see that these people were steadfast and maintained through all the persecutions, and they're still there. Their faith is strong. Their charity is strong. 
That is comforting. And we ought to remember this and recognize this. And even something as simple as just sending out a letter, making a phone call, keeping in touch with someone, hey, how are you doing, can go a long way to comfort people and to strengthen them when they're going through hard times especially or when there's a possibility that someone's going to be facing some, some persecution or trouble or anything that might shake their faith. And we need to be remembering that and keeping people in our thoughts and in our prayers to be looking out for them as the Apostle Paul did. is a great example. He was concerned about these people in Thessalonica. So much, he sent, he sent someone out, check up on them. How are you doing? It's, it's the love that, that a parent has for their children. I mean, think about what your child, even if, when they're grown up and they're out of the house, if something that you know happens within the family, some bad news, something that might cause them some anguish, what are you going to do? You're going to want to know how they're doing. And if, if needs be, you're going to go out there yourself or send someone else out there to make sure everything's okay. And that's the type of love, that's the type of uh, compassion that we see the Apostle Paul has for other believers, and that's the same type of love that we ought to have for other people. And remember to, to be able to comfort and, and to strengthen them. I, I have a verse 8, he says, For now we live. If you, as we say, ye stand fast in the Lord. If you're standing fast, hey, we're living. Because you're comforting us that much. It helps us to keep going forward, knowing that you're doing well. Verse number 9 says, For what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish, establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all, our, with all his saints." He was worried about these people, but look at, he had joy. And um, the joy that he received was because of the good news that he got back. And um, we ought to have joy when we serve the Lord. We ought to be able to, to be joyful over the, the successes of other people. And just in general, when we serve God, the Bible says in Galatians 5, it talks, there's the verses that talk about the fruit of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and it goes on and on. You know, when you're walking in the Spirit and doing God's work, we ought to have joy. And this is the time he, says, he was saying here, we joy for your sakes during a, ver a time of a lot of tribulation. So even when you're going through hard times, difficult times, times where everything seems to be going out of control, you can still have joy. And we still need to be able to find that joy in the service to God and, and in caring for other people and hearing from them. Um, turn, if you would, to Psalm 100. Psalm 100, I'll read for you Psalm 122, verse 1. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the attitude that we need to have. Are you happy to come to church? Is it something that brings you joy? Or is it a drudge? Is it just, oh, it's Sunday morning, I got to go to church. Well, I guess I'll go again Sunday evening because I set that standard up for myself, but I don't really want to go. No, you know, we ought, we ought to be glad. Now, look, we're, I know we're not perfect, and I know we're all human. I know there's going to be times where you're, you may not feel like going to church. Okay, it's going to happen. And that's why the standard's in place. But if we were perfect, you would always be joyful. And we ought, we ought to remember the reasons why we come to church. Remember the sacrifice that God had made for us and the importance of coming and the importance of other people. The times when you don't want to come to church, start thinking about the other, the other members of the congregation. Someone who might be looking to you for strength. Someone who might be thinking about well, I wonder if Brother Robert's going to be in church today because I really, you know, need to talk to him about something or, or you know, I, I really, you know, he's a friend of mine or whatever. You know, people look to other people in church and sometimes you don't even realize it. I'll tell you what, if nothing else, you could think about me because every single one of you matter to me. Everybody in this church matters when you're, when you're here and when you're not here especially. I'm always thinking and concerned, oh, I wonder where so-and-so is. I hope everything's okay. 
And I care about the, what's going on in the lives of everybody here. And it's an encouragement when, when more people show up and, oh man, this person's here, this person's here, this person's here. Hey, that's great. That's a blessing. That's awesome. You're being a blessing to me just by being here, just by showing up. So maybe when you kind of have a bad attitude about coming to church, remember that, hey, at least Pastor Burson's going to be happy to see me. At least I'm going to be doing him some good by showing up to church. And hopefully that'll bring some joy into, into attending and not thinking that it's just a big pain and a big burden to show up to church. Psalm 100, look at verse number one. The Bible says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. There's so many reasons to be thankful for God. His mercy is everlasting. He's good. His truth endures forever to all generations. He's saying, verse 2 again, serve the Lord with gladness. Now think about that. God has given us a job to do. Imagine, I don't know if any of you have um, ever been like a boss over anyone else. If you ever had employees underneath you. But even if you haven't, you'll be able to get the point. Think about how the difference in your boss's attitude if all he had working for him were people that just didn't want to be there at all. Right? You've got a supervisor, a boss, and every single person on the shift is just, they don't want to be there. First of all, how effective is whatever job they're doing going to be, whatever the business is, whatever the operation is, whatever is supposed to be getting done, how effective do you think that crew is going to work together when nobody wants to be there? You're going to be hitting bare bottom on pro productivity. You're going to be hitting the minimum or below the minimum. Because when, when you're not excited to be at work, or not excited to be doing something, when your heart's not in it, you're not going to be devoting nearly what you ought to be devoting. No boss wants, that, wants to be surrounded by people that don't want to be there. And, and, you know, that's a quick way to lose your job, too, by the way. If you just always have this bad attitude of, well, I have to be here. I don't want to be here. The people that move up are the ones that, that go to work. That, you know, maybe it's not the best job in the world, but you're happy you got a job. You're happy they're being employed. You're happy someone's paying your way, and you're going to do whatever work you need to do because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to work hard and, uh, and do what we need to do to get by. Now, um... Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. God has given us a job. God's our boss. And even in the secular world, we ought to be working for people as we would work for Jesus Christ himself, as if he were our boss. But more importantly, even than that, is you know, when you come to church, when you show up, when you're receiving knowledge, when you're hearing from God's word, when you're going out and knocking on doors and you're bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're working for the Lord directly. We ought not to be showing up to work with a, with a bad attitude, with a rotten attitude. That's not going to be very pleasing to our God. He wants you here. He wants you to be happy to be here and, and appreciative of his mercy and appreciative of his goodness and appreciative of the truth that he gives you and the love that he provides for you and be willing to do anything for him. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 18. Not only has God given us a job, but what an honor it is for God to even consider to give us a job and a job that has a lot of importance. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. 
Be ye reconciled to God. The job, the important job of people coming to Jesus Christ, being reconciled because of their sins to God. Our sin creates a big problem between us and God, and God has given us the job to help people to come back to him, to help people to receive forgiveness, to, to show people that free gift so that they can accept it and be reconciled with God. The consequences, the outcome of that job is a matter of heaven and hell, life and death. There is nothing more important than that. And God has given us that job. Now, not only is a lot of responsibility, but what an honor. God doesn't give us that job thinking, that, oh, these guys can never do that. No, God knows you can do it and God expects you to do it. And it is an honor to be given this particular job. He didn't give it to the angels. He didn't give it to anyone else. He gave it to you, to every believer. It's your job to reconcile people to God. We have a job to do. We ought, we ought to be happy to do that. We ought to be willing and joyful and, and give it our all and not drag our feet. See, the, the, it's funny when you see the Jehovah's Witnesses out, out knocking on doors. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been seeing them for, I, I can't even count how many years now, going out door to door. We see them when we go out soul winning, you see them come to your house. I have yet to see anyone walk with any pep in their step at all. Every single one, it's like, it is, it's the death march. It's just a slow, slothful, why? Because they don't want to be there, but they, ha they just feel like they have to do it. It's just, we got to check it off. So they put in their 59 minutes and 59 seconds, and that's it. And they just want it to just get over as fast as possible. Versus people who have zeal, someone who actually knows that, you know, look, they also don't believe that hell's real. I mean, they believe that you're just going to be annihilated. So what's the big hurry? What's the big deal anyways? Seriously, when you don't believe, what do you believe hell's real? And people are going to be tortured and tormented forever in a burning, fiery furnace. That kind of lights a fire under your rear to go out there and do something. And when you see people have zeal, hey, they're, they're ready to go. Let's go. Let's preach the gospel. And this is the attitude that we ought to have when we're out working for God. Hey, let's do this. This is important. We're reconciling people to God because Jesus Christ isn't here to do it himself. He's given us this job. It's an important job. Let's go out and do it. Let's get excited about it. I mean, it, this, we're actually doing something that's real. You know, I mean, you might have a job flipping burgers. You might have a job putting little widgets together and you just look at this and be like, this is all vain. This doesn't really accomplish anything. But not when you're working for God. This has eternal value. People's souls going to heaven is, lasts forever. That is more valuable than any other thing that you can be doing. And that ought to be exciting in and of itself. Turn if you were to Acts chapter 5. I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. The Bible reads, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He's saying, whether I want to do it or not, it's my job to do this. And actually, it's woe unto me if I don't do this. We need to remember that, but let's focus on, hey, if I do this willingly, I've got a reward. Let's focus on the good part and, and be excited about this and be willing to go out and put in our time and be joyful about it and, and lead people to Christ. We ought to work joyfully, and there really is no reason not to work joyfully, and it all just boils down to your perspective. How are you looking at things? Is this just a big burden for you? Well, why is that? Why, why is your perspective looking at this as just trouble? Well, because you'd rather be spending your time doing what? Or, hey, I'm doing a really good work here. This is great. We're going to lead someone to Christ today. They're not going to go to hell. 
compare that to whatever it is that, that you're so upset that you can't be doing because it's eating into your precious time and compare the value. Someone going to heaven or whatever the inconvenience was, that was that's giving you such a bad attitude. This is why and I've mentioned this in other sermons. You know, when you, when you have a bad attitude just about anything and you lead someone to Christ, that changes your whole day because that perspective is there. At least you've led someone to Christ. My, my family went out and, and I think, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to be a good example, uh, we have not done this until Wednesday with my entire family. My entire family went out soul winning, which, you know, we've got five children, including little ones, including an infant of four months. And you know what? That's not easy to do. It's not. When you've got a whole bunch of kids that go out and knock on doors. But I kind of wanted to show and just be an example that there's no reason why you can't do this. You really, you really can. Is, is it more difficult? Yeah. Yeah. Can we spend as much time as a single guy going out selling? No. But you can still do it. And we did it. And you know what? You have to deal with certain things. You have to deal sometimes with the baby crying. You have to deal with, oh man, there's a poopy diaper. Now what am I going to do? We're out in the middle of nowhere. Oh man, this is a big blow up. You know, it can make people not want to go out and do it anymore at all. But when you deal with all that stuff and then you go to the next door and someone gets saved, guess what happens about all those concerns? They're out the window. It's gone. It's a perspective. You got, you got to maintain the proper perspective of why are you out doing this and not being focused on all the trials and tribulations and the hardships and the things that, that might make things a little bit difficult. Your outlook on your service to God will affect other people in the church. I know I mentioned that before. I'm bringing it up again. We need to be an encouragement to others. How encouraging is it to talk bad about soul winning as if it's a drug drudgery? What are you going to do to the church when you come in and be like, oh man, got to go soul winning. You know, so, uh, last week someone yelled at me. Last week someone called the cops. That's not very encouraging. And what's, what's the point of that? Or complaining about the hard areas. And look, I've been guilty of this myself. Okay, so I, I, I'm not you know, throwing anybody under the bus. In particular, I'll throw myself under the bus. I, I, I'm already confessing the attitude I started to get into. And part of it probably had to do with hitting a hard area of soul winning. That, that had an impact on me, but shame on me for not maintaining the proper attitude. Because even when you hit the hard areas, we, do, we just got done Thank God, <laughs> we just got done, I'll uh, joke about it, but we just got done hitting an area where, you know, they've got this HOA and they've got all these signs up about no soliciting and the people that live there are really serious about the no soliciting. They get really angry when you come to the door and then, and most of them, even when it's not a no soliciting thing, most of them just don't want to have anything to do with you. They don't want to hear it. They just want to shut you down. And you know what? That can be a little bit discouraging, but we need to remember and keep the focus on, hey, what about that girl that got saved in that neighborhood? What about the guy that got saved in that neighborhood? What about the one or two or three people that you do end up reaching? Doesn't matter. You may have to hit a lot of doors and, and deal with a lot of people that are, you know, honestly being jerks with you. But so what? It's not a cause to, to, to just bring everybody down about going out and working for God. Do you think God looked down on, on the attitude of, oh man, we got to talk to these people? You really end up looking down on people. I mean, you don't know whose door you're going to knock on. You don't know in each individual. I mean, that's a, that's a rotten attitude. And I'm glad now, you know, I've got I've to recenter and refocus on this. I mean, think about the... And, and, what we get upset about is often extremely trivial and really not a big deal at all. I mean, key, like, think about this. If you're like, well, I don't want to go sewing because I don't want to go to this neighborhood. And all you're dealing with is people who don't really want to listen to you in general. 
What did the disciples deal with when they went soul winning? And we're going to be worried or complaining about people who just don't want to listen to you? Did the disciples complain when they were beaten for preaching the gospel? I mean, beaten. Did we go into Granville and people just open up their door and just, oh, you're preaching Jesus. Stop it. No, they didn't do that. Not even close. Acts chapter 5, look at verse number 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. We weren't called in front of the HOA board and got whipped or beaten because we were in their neighborhood preaching the gospel of Jesus and just commanded, don't preach in this name. Not even close. But look at verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Not only were they not discouraged, not only did they not complain about it, they did the exact opposite. They rejoiced. They thought it was great. Praise God. God thinks that we're worthy enough to suffer a little bit of shame. Why? Because that puts them that much closer to Jesus Christ. You look at the shame and what Jesus Christ went through, and you're not any better than Jesus, my friend. And he went through all that willingly. He went through that forever for other people. Look, when they're going out and preaching Jesus, it wasn't for themselves. It was for these other people. And they were counted worthy to suffer the beatings, to go through that hard time, and to demonstrate their love, and they were happy for that. That's the right attitude. We need to turn this attitude around. Oh, this is a hard area. When someone gives you a hard time, be happy about that. And that's like, it's so minor in comparison. But have the right outlook. Have the right perspective. Turn if you go to Matthew 13. We can have another impact. We have a lot of impact on other people, whether it's inside of the church or outside of the church, whether it's in here in the church family or at home with your own family. Our attitudes will rub off on other people. When other people get excited about serving God and they start getting zealous, oh man, I want to go soul winning. Oh, I want to start this new ministry. Oh, I want to reach people this way. Don't go and throw a wet blanket on them. Don't go and tell them all the reasons why it's not a good idea and why it's going to fail. And, oh, you can't do that. Oh, what about this? And what about that? And, and you got to do all these other things. Look, don't be discouraging people from doing good works for God. This can happen, again, without you even realizing it. And especially towards those in your own house. Spouses, you know, mom, dad, children, inside of your house, you know, just, just, Nope, that's not a good idea. Look at Matthew 13, verse number 54. The Bible says, And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? This is in reference to Jesus, excuse me, Jesus Christ. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Instead of rejoicing in him, instead of receiving what he was teaching, Jesus Christ comes back to his hometown and is teaching and is preaching and has all this wisdom. And they're acknowledging the wisdom. But they're saying, well, where did he get this? We go, isn't he just his carpenter's son? Who does he think he is coming out and, and, and preaching all this stuff? And they were offended in what he was saying instead of receiving it. And this is people that he knew. These were his friends, people, you know, his acquaintances. 
It says in verse 57, they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. In your own house, be aware of discouraging another person in your house that wants to do good, that's, that's trying to do right, and preventing them from doing many mighty works. Because you're just given every reason for them not to do that. And just completely discouraging what, what they're trying to do. Think about that in church and at home. We need to be encouraging people to do more for to serve the Lord, not discouraging them from serving God. We need to have the, the mentality, the mindset that the people in the book of Acts did. It's one of the reasons why Acts is my favorite book of the whole Bible. Is because when you could have somebody get beaten and then be happy about it and leap for joy, that says a lot. And then continue. Because you notice in, in the verse that we already read in Acts 5, and it said, after they were beaten, it says, and daily in the temple in every house, they ceased not. They didn't stop to teach and preach. You know, people use that verse all the time for soul winning as in, hey, we need to go door to door. Hey, this is daily. Hey, we need to be doing this regularly and have a tendency to lose the context that this happened right after they were beaten. Like the whole point, it's saying that, yes, it's important to do this daily, but they were doing it daily even with such persecution of being beaten that that didn't slow them down for a second. Not at all. They continued moving forward. Acts chapter 13. I'll just read this for you. You can turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 13, verse 50 reads, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And again, it's just one more example of them just being happy. You know, they're getting kicked out of places. You know, they're getting just barred from, from wherever. They're, they're getting expelled from, from cities and whatever. And they're happy about it. No skin off their back. You think they might get irritated or agitated. Oh, man, I'm not going to, what's the point of even going out and do this? The people are just going to throw us out. No, they're happy about it and they move on. Well, we're going to keep on working. This is, this is great. When you can truly enjoy serving the Lord, you will be doing more. You will be, when you're happy with your job, you're going to be excited about getting the work done and you're going to be pushing yourself to do even more. And you could keep the proper perspective instead of getting down or discouraged. Now, in order to have that joy, you need to get over yourself. You need, you need to just get over people being mean to you or whatever the case may be and, and, and remind yourself it's not about you. If you make it about you, then you are going to get discouraged. If you make it about you, then there's always going to be problems and you're, and you're going to stop doing the work because it's, if it's about you. But the whole point is that it's not about you. Look at Acts 20, verse number 22. Verse number 22 reads, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. See, the way that the Apostle Paul, he had this attitude. He said, I know that there's going to be all these problems in Jerusalem and I keep going. I'm still going to do this because I'm going to, you know, these things aren't moving me. I'm not worried about, about the bad things that could happen. Why? Because I don't count my life dear to myself. So I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And whatever happens, happens. And that way you could finish your course with joy. See, if he, was, if he was too concerned about all the things that might happen to him, you're not going to be joyful about that. If he's just concerned, oh man, what's going to happen when I get there? Oh, are they going to beat me again? Are they going to stone me? What are they, they going to do? And just start thinking about him. What, what, what's going to happen to me? That can make you not very happy. But if he's thinking, you know what? I'm going to go through... And I'm going to do God's work. 
Whatever God allows, he allows. And, and if he's going to protect me, he protects me. But I'm going to be happy about doing my work because I'm not even that worried about losing my life if I'm losing my life for the cause of Christ. I mean, that's a, that's a strong attitude. That's an extreme attitude to have. But that's the attitude that God wants us to have. It's a good attitude to have when you're serving God and, and in order to maintain that joy. Serving God is not always easy. You can feel worn out. You can start to get tired. You can start to lose your joy. Like I said, this happens, and the whole point of this sermon is to try to help you to overcome that when that happens. If that's not your case now, just remember this sermon. For me, it was, this is the point I was getting to. And it's a little embarrassing even saying that, but it's true. And it's, it's important enough that, that I felt that I wanted to share that with everybody. But at the end of the day, and this is my last point, you know, God's able to strengthen you when, even when you're weary. Maintain the right perspective. It's not about you. You're thinking about other people. You're thinking about God. You're thinking about doing work for them to not get discouraged. Turn if you would. I'll just have you turn to Psalm 126, the last place I'll have you turn. I'm going to read for you from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. God doesn't get weary. God doesn't stop, obviously. He's all powerful. But then verse 29 of Isaiah 40 says, He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And what the, what the scripture is saying there is they're saying that even young people, even people who physically are really fit, even people who have a lot of strength and, and energy naturally, they will end up falling. They will lose their strength eventually. It's going it's to go away. But those that rely on the God, those that wait on the Lord, those that are looking to God and serving Him, God can provide them strength that never fails. And when you start to feel weary and worn out just spiritually and you feel drained and I, say, I don't know how I could take this anymore, Look, wait on the Lord. Rely on God. Talk to God and, and ask Him to help you. And He has the strength to get you through forever. To continue on and keep moving forward. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't be weary in the good work that you're doing. Don't let it wear you down. Because the reaping is going to come. It's a promise. It's there. Just don't faint. Don't stop. Don't get out of the work. Don't let that bring you down completely. Continue moving forward. Psalm 126. We'll close with this. Psalm 126, verse number 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Very famous passage, but again, a good reminder that, you know, we may go forth in tears. We may deal with some, some hardships and struggles, but we need to keep moving forward. And we know that we're going to be reaping in joy. You go out with those struggles. I was saying, I mean, this is a perfect soul winning example. You go out with these problems and you're dealing with all these other things. And, but when you reap, you reap in joy. And it's gonna, that, that turns things around for you. We need to keep the right mentality. We need to keep the right attitude. We need to be focused on maintaining our attitude so that we can provoke others with zeal, with a zeal to, to go so into, with a zeal to do more. I want this church to do so much more than we're doing right now. And look, I'm not slam, again, I'm not slamming anybody at all. It's just this vision. Right? And hopefully you have the same vision. And hopefully you're excited about this church being here. And hopefully you're excited about the opportunities that we have. Look, there have been churches that have been closing their doors, our IFB churches. Now, I'm not happy that people who may have the right gospel, you know, those churches are going away. But this is still an opportunity for us. Look, we need to step it up. We need to get excited. We need to be doing more 
for the people here and doing more to, to, to give of our time and give of ourselves and, and be happy, be joyful about it to reach more people and to do the work for God that he has laid out for this church to do. There's a lot of work to be done. I'm, getting, I'm excited for the, the showing on Saturday. I'm excited for to actually get things rolling that I've been wanting to do for so long. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm done saying, oh, I have all these plans, all these things I want to do. I'm going to start doing them. And hopefully you're here willing to help. And you're going to stop saying, you know, oh, I want to do something and, and start doing Let's, let's get our works, in the, let's get our, our thoughts into actions. Let's get our desires and put them in place because you can talk all day long, but talk isn't going to get anything done. Let's get excited about these things. Let, let's see the value in all the work that we're going to be doing and, and start pressing ourselves to move forward and to do more. And let's, let's, let's try not to be discouraged. And you know, if I've discouraged anyone in this church, I apologize right now. But I've repented and I'm going forward and you're going to see a more zealous pastor going forward. It's power as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, the comfort that we can receive from other believers. God, I thank you for all the, the great things that went on at that preaching conference in Sacramento, Lord. I pray that you please help our church to um, be unified in our spirit and our zeal to serve you, dear Lord. I pray that you will please just open up some blessings upon our church, upon our families, dear Lord. Help us uh, to, to be motivated to do the right things, to serve you more, dear God, and that you would just build this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.